Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all for coming to our annual winter conference. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My name is John Tweedale, and I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the academic dean and professor of theology here at Reformation Bible College. This session is going to be a little bit different than your morning sessions. Uh, this is going to be a preview of a RBC classroom. Uh, I get to teach in church history and theology, so this lecture today is going to be Tweedale on Sproul, on Calvin, on the Word of God. And so ultimately, we want you to be encouraged in your own understanding of the Word of God, and so that's why we are here today. A number of years ago, Dr. Derek Thomas and I edited a book for Crossway where we collected a series of essays summarizing the life and theology of the great reformer, John Calvin. And we were delighted to have Dr. Sproul contribute a short reflection on the legacy of Calvin that we appended as an afterword to our volume. And Sproul gives a masterful summary of Calvin's life, but then he uses Calvin to issue a clarion call for us as Christians to carry out the work of Reformation today. We can't just look back to the golden era of the Reformation as if there was one, but no, we have to be faithful today as Christians and really pray for God's blessing for a new Reformation. And so it's in that spirit that we're going to be thinking about the work of Calvin and the shape of Calvin's theology on the teaching of Dr. Sproul. Well, Dr. Sproul opens his essay on Calvin by observing that Calvin, the great Genevan reformer, stood head and shoulders above the rank and file theologian and scholar and biblical expositor of church history. Sproul notes that Calvin rightly takes his place alongside the great theologians of church history. You've got Augustine and Aquinas and Luther and Edwards, and among those luminaries, you have the Genevan reformer, John Calvin. It was said of Aristotle that he was the philosopher. Well, Philip Melanchthon, who was Martin Luther's chief lieutenant, would say that Calvin was the theologian. So throughout church history, he is known as a great theologian of God's Word. So different theologians contribute in different ways in the history of the church. And so Dr. Sproul observes that Augustine, for example, excelled in probing the depths of the human heart and scaling the heights of God's nature and being. Aquinas, for example, was a master of synthesis where he showed the link between philosophy and theology. Luther was a brilliant communicator who stood for the authority of the Word of God as he proclaimed with bombast the truth of justification by faith alone. But Calvin, as Dr. Sproul observes, was a genius at expounding and organizing biblical truth in a clear, concise way that was both compelling and beautiful. And so this morning, I want to consider ways in which Calvin's teaching informed and shaped Dr. Sproul's theology. And I want to especially uh, look at the early years of Dr. Sproul's ministry to show how formative Calvin's teaching was on his thought. And so I want to go into the vault of early Dr. Sproul's library and introduce you to some less familiar of his works. 
In the first place, I want us to think about the role of Calvin and Scripture in Dr. Sproul's theology. Calvin and Scripture. And we're going to spend most of our time here because I think Calvin was most instrumental and foundational in Dr. Sproul's thinking and teaching on the doctrine of Scripture. And I want to begin way back in the 1970s. In 1974, when Dr. Sproul published his second book, Ecology of Atheism, The Psychology of Atheism. It's also known under the title, If There is a God, Why Are There Atheists? In fact, Dr. Ken Jones referred to this title just a few minutes ago. The book is dedicated to R.C.'s mentor, John Gershner, who he calls as a teacher and counselor and friend a burning and shining light. It's a reminder that we need good teachers in our lives, that we stand on the shoulders of giants as we seek to understand God's Word. And Calvin was such a teacher for Dr. Sproul. Well, in this book, The Psychology of Atheism, Dr. Sproul overturns the common trope that Christians imagine God in order to cope with pain. The idea that belief in God is an opium for the masses. He shows that while humans may indeed desire and create a deity who meets their felt needs, we do not instinctively desire a God who is holy, omniscient, and sovereign. When you actually meet the God of the Bible, it is traumatic, and we want nothing to do with Him. And so, Dr. Sproul argues that we as fallen humans by nature are hostile toward God. And so, in this book, he looks at the psychology of unbelief. To use the language of Romans 1.18, as sinful people, we suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. And so, the book is an analysis of the psychological motivations of unbelief, an examination of why we reject the truth claims of Scripture as fallen people. It's the rejection of truth that provokes the anger of God, that we have this traumatic experience of the righteousness of God that produces anger inside of us, and so we suppress and reject that truth of who God is. And so, we want nothing to do with this God. Well, in Dr. Sproul's exposition of Romans 1, he interacts extensively with John Calvin's commentary on Romans. And I mention this because we often think of Calvin as a man of one book, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. But we forget that Calvin's writing on theology has to be situated in the context of his biblical exposition. So, yes, read the Institutes of the Christian Religion, but understand they were intended to be read alongside of Calvin's commentaries and Calvin's sermons and Calvin's occasional writings and Calvin's letters. And so, in preparation for this talk, I had the great joy of looking at several of Dr. Sproul's commentaries from Calvin, especially on Calvin's commentary on Romans. And so, building off of Calvin, Dr. Sproul argues that general revelation, that is the knowledge of God common to all humanity, right, the knowledge of God in the skies and in our conscience, general revelation is insufficient to lead us in the righteous path. In other words, general revelation is insufficient to redeem us. It is sufficient to condemn us but insufficient to convert us. And yet, Dr. Sproul notes that the deficiency of general revelation is rooted not in the lack of clarity, 
right? Because the light of the knowledge of the glory of God revealed in God's creation is abundantly clear. The problem is not in the revelation, is it? The problem is in our rebellious hearts. The problem is our ingratitude. The problem is our suppression of the truth. In other words, the problem of sin is not simply an intellectual problem. It's the result of a moral revolution where we reject the claims of God. In the words of, J- of Jesus in John 3, 19, the light has come into the world and men have loved darkness rather than light. And so Calvin here is clearly an influence on Dr. Sproul's thinking as he expounds general revelation as it is discovered in Romans chapter 1. And as natural people, we suppress this truth, and so we need a moral revolution to have our eyes awaken to the truth of Scripture. We need the Holy Spirit to regenerate us so that we may embrace the wisdom of God. So moving from general revelation, I want us to think a little bit about special revelation. And this also comes from some insights that Dr. Sproul has also in 1974. In 1974, Dr. Sproul contributed to a series of essays in a book titled God's Inerrant Word. The book was edited by John Warwick Montgomery, who was the well-known Lutheran theologian and lawyer. And the essays were the result of several public addresses given at the Conference on the Inspiration and Authority of Scripture held in Ligonier, Pennsylvania at the Ligonier Study Center in the year 1973. The conference was a response to the rising tide of higher criticism and growing skepticism over the doctrines of inerrancy and infallibility in the evangelical church. And so the background here is what historians call the modernist and fundamentalist controversy in the early part of the 20th century, and then the battle for the Bible right in the middle of the 20th century. So evangelicals were in a war debating the truth claims of Scripture. But this conference in Ligonier not only produced this series of essays, they also produced a short statement on biblical inerrancy that became the foundation for the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy that was put together by an international gathering of scholars in the year 1978, one of whom was Dr. Sproul. So this conference in 1973 produced a book in 1974 titled God's Inerrant Word. And Dr. Sproul has a chapter in this book simply titled The Case for inerrancy, a methodological approach. The arguments in this chapter actually anticipate much of Dr. Sproul's work on the doctrine of Scripture throughout the entirety of his career. He argues that we must not only present a case for biblical inerrancy, but we need to make rational arguments for it. His argument, in other words, moves from the premise of the trustworthiness of Scripture to the conclusion of belief in biblical inerrancy, and he does so in six steps. Now, I wish we had an hour to think through his argument. I just want to read through it very quickly, and, and you'll get a snapshot of the cogency and rigor of Dr. Sproul's early writings. He basically makes a six-step argument for inerrancy. Premise number one, premise A, the Bible is basically reliable and a trustworthy document. 
starts with the trustworthiness and reliability of the Bible. Premise two, on the basis of this reliable document, we have sufficient evidence to believe confidently that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, he's making a linear argument, moving from the Bible as a reliable document that's historically accurate to its claims about Jesus. Number three, Jesus Christ being the Son of God is an infallible authority. So, if we're going to take the claims of Christ seriously, if He is the Son of God, then we have to actually pay attention to what He says. Number four, Jesus Christ teaches that the Bible is more than generally trustworthy because God is utterly trustworthy. So, it's not just basically, it's entirely trustworthy. Number five, that the Word in that it comes from God is utterly trustworthy provides us confidence that what God says we can believe. And then number six, the conclusion, on the basis of the infallibility and authority of Jesus Christ, the church believes the Bible to be utterly trustworthy. That is infallible and inerrant. So, we believe the Bible because Jesus gives us full confidence to trust Scripture, and there are good historical arguments to make. Now, I wish we could unpack all of that, but we can't. We don't have time to probe this argument, but what I do want to do is mention one part of it where Dr. Sproul builds off of Calvin's argument for what is often called the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. Remember I said God has spoken generally in general revelation. We've suppressed that truth because of sin, and we need the Holy Spirit to illumine our minds and hearts that we embrace the truth of God's Word. Calvin would talk about the internal witness of the Holy Spirit. And so, as Reformed Christians following Calvin, we rightly affirm that the Holy Spirit enables us to believe the Bible that He inspired right? The Spirit does not work apart from the Scripture that He inspired. Unfortunately, Dr. Sproul argues, sometimes people in the Reformed and Evangelical world give the impression that we don't have to pay attention to the rational arguments of Scripture because we have the Holy Spirit. And so, on the one hand, he says there are those who affirm the validity of evidence for the inerrancy of Scripture, but they'll deny the Spirit. And then there are others who want to affirm the work of the Spirit and say the Spirit works apart from these evidences, right? Evidence like historical data, the testimony of miracles, the consistency of Scripture's message, the fulfillment of prophecy. We don't have to not pay attention to those things. We don't reject those things. No, the Spirit of God works through the data of Scripture to confirm its veracity upon our hearts and lives. Sometimes, then, we give the impression that belief in the witness of the Holy Spirit invalidates the evidence of biblical authority. But Dr. Sproul shows that this is contrary to the teaching of Calvin. Calvin argues that the testimony of the Spirit does not cause people to believe Scripture contrary to evidence, but causes us to surrender to that evidence. The Spirit of God enables us to delight in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit persuades us that the proofs of Scripture are indeed true. So, to put the matter succinctly, the Spirit persuades us by the proof of Scripture. The Spirit does not work apart from the Scripture He inspired, but He works through Scripture so that subjectively we have confirmation of the objective truth of God's Word. All of this is in that little essay in God's inerrant Word. And this basic argument that Dr. Sproul will make will be repeated 
in his work, Classical Apologetics, that he wrote with Dr. Gershner and Dr. Lindsay. It also will be found later in Dr. Sproul's writing on Defending Your Faith, which is an introduction to uh, apologetics. But maybe the great summary of this truth is found in the Chicago Statement itself, and you will hear echoes of both Calvin and Dr. Sproul in Article 17 of the Chicago Statement. We affirm that the Holy Spirit bears witness to the Scriptures, assuring believers of the trustworthiness of God's written Word. And we deny that this witness of the Holy Spirit operates in isolation of or against Scripture. The Spirit gives us confidence to believe that Scripture is the Word of God. So that's Calvin and Scripture, and it would have an enormous impact on Dr. Sproul's theology. Secondly, and more quickly, we can think of Calvin and the doctrine of God. This comes from another early writing of Dr. Sproul's, and in 1976, Dr. Sproul edited a volume of essays in honor of his mentor, John Gershner, and the book is simply titled, Soli Deo Gloria, To the Glory of God Alone. And Dr. Sproul writes a short article on the topic of double predestination. And the arguments of this chapter will lay the groundwork to his wonderful and more well-known book, Chosen by God, right? which was certainly one of the first books by Dr. Sproul I read. I read it when I was in college. I was waiting to have my oil changed on my car in Hattiesburg, Mississippi as a college student, and I read Chosen by God. Well, the seed of Chosen by God is in these essays in honor of Dr. Gershner. And the point that Dr. Sproul makes is to argue against a view he calls equal ultimacy. The doctrine of equal ultimacy is based on the concept of symmetry in relationship to God's attitude toward the elect and the reprobate. As Dr. Sproul summarizes, just as God positively intervenes in the lives of the elect to create faith in their hearts, so God equally and positively intervenes in the lives of the reprobate to create unbelief in their lives and in their hearts. Oh, what's the problem with that? The problem is what Dr. Sproul calls a positive, positive view of double predestination, which is completely, utterly, entirely wrong. This is emphatically not the biblical view of predestination. In contrast, Dr. Sproul presents what he calls the positive, negative view of predestination. The Reformed and biblical view of predestination teaches that God positively intervenes in the lives of the elect to ensure and guarantee their salvation. However, in contrast, the Reformed view teaches that God passively and negatively leaves the rest of humanity to themselves. He does not create unbelief in their hearts. He does not coerce people to sin, no, the reprobate are responsible for their rejection of God. And so there is an asymmetry to election and predestination and reprobation. What's interesting here is in all of this discussion, Calvin only gets a passing reference, but that is important. You see, sometimes we read the Reformers and we think, well, they are Lone Ranger Christians. It was Luther against the world, Calvin against the world, and we forget they were surrounded by an army of faithful but forgotten ministers and faithful lay Christians. You see, church history is the unfolding of the 
faithful efforts of forgotten people who come alongside our heroes. And actually, Dr. Sproul notes that Calvin's teaching on double predestination is in a stream of consensus that can be traced throughout all of church history. And so he places Calvin along a spectrum from Augustine and Aquinas and Luther and Calvin and Zanchius and Perkins and Edwards, of course, and Turretin and Hodge and Warfield and Bavinck, right? Calvin is just one of an army. And not only that, Dr. Sproul references many of the Reformed Confessions, the, Re- the French Confession, the Belgic Confession, the Second Helvetic Confession, the Westminster Confession. There is a great Reformed consensus on the teaching of the Word of God regarding His sovereignty and salvation. So Calvin was not a lone ranger here, but Calvin was part of a wide movement of Reformation that sought to recover the teaching of Scripture on the doctrine of God. So that's Calvin and Scripture, Calvin and God. We could look at many other topics You could think of Calvin on wisdom, where Calvin says true wisdom consists of knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves, and you'll see R.C. refer to that throughout his writings. You can think of Calvin referred to justification by faith alone as the hinge upon which a relationship with God turns. You can think of Calvin's statement that prayer is the chief exercise of faith or Calvin's teaching on the Lord's Supper where we spiritually commune with Christ as we feast upon the sacrament with God's people. All of these precious teachings are found throughout Dr. Sproul's writings, but I want to end by thinking with you for just a couple of minutes on Calvin's teaching on the law as it relates to the Christian life. And I found a section in a book that I was unfamiliar with. In 1992, Dr. Sproul wrote a book titled, The Soul's Quest for a God. And up until last week, I was not familiar with this book. The Soul's Quest for God is an examination of the biblical pattern of spiritual growth. And here he draws on the example of many people from church history. One is Calvin. And he actually makes the claim that Calvin's teaching on the law is one of the Reformers' most important contributions in the history of the church. And so Dr. Sproul highlights Calvin's arguments for the threefold use of the law, the threefold use of the law. The first use communicates the righteousness of God. The law is a mirror, and it exposes our sin. The second use, the law is a mandate, and it restrains lawlessness, right? So, a speed limit sign is a legal restraint on reckless driving. The law is a good thing in human society because it curbs people's base sinful desires. But lastly and thirdly, the third use of the law shows Christians that the law is not to be despised. The law is a mirror, the law is a mandate, but the law is a map to guide us in how we are to live. The law is a reflection of the character of the holiness of God. So, to love God is to love His law. To reject the law is to reject God. So, as Christians, we delight in the law of God because it leads us in the pathway of happiness and holiness in obedience to the Word of God. Well, when you read Dr. Sproul on Calvin, you come away with the profound lesson that we need good and godly teachers to show us the truth claims of Scripture.
And so I close with these words from Dr. Sproul in the essay that he wrote for the book that Dr. Thomas and I edited on Calvin. Dr. Sproul says, and this is the last line of our book, our debt to Calvin is considerable. We must be mindful of his work as God continues to use his teaching to lead the church to truth and out of the abyss of error. And so as we read Dr. Sproul, as we read Calvin, as we read the Word of God, may we be faithful to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may the Lord use us so that we might see a new reformation. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for giving us teachers. We pray that by Your Spirit, You would help each one here to be faithful to the Word of God. We pray this now in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so good to have everybody here again. It's been way too long since we've been able to gather in, in groups like this, so I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be able to see flesh and blood people again and not be looking into a computer. Uh, if you've looked at the outline of your schedule for today's sessions, you will notice that the breakout sessions include the names of four people, John Calvin, Jonathan Edwards, John Gerstner, and Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas Aquinas sticks out on that list like a sore thumb. I mean, most importantly, he's the only one whose name isn't John, but almost as important as the fact that John Calvin, Edwards, Gerstner, these were all Reformed theologians, as was Dr. Sproul. Thomas Aquinas, on the other hand, is a 13th century medieval Roman Catholic, so why in the world is he on this list? How would he influence Dr. Sproul? Most of you know how strongly Dr. Sproul felt about the doctrine of justification by faith alone, and most of you, if you're familiar with Roman Catholic theology or Thomas Aquinas, know he didn't teach that doctrine. So what, what gives here? Why would he uh, appreciate this so much? One of the most basic reasons is that Dr. Sproul first of all recognized the sheer intellect of Thomas Aquinas. He wrote a chapter for a book back in the 80s that um, included chapters by different authors on different individual Christians throughout the history of the church, and Dr. Sproul wrote on Thomas Aquinas. The book's not in print anymore, but that chapter is available on Ligonier's website. And in it, he says he believes that Thomas Aquinas is one of the two most brilliant theologians in the history of the other church, in the history of the church, and he thinks the other one is Jonathan Edwards. And that's it's not really a, a, it's not a surprise that he thinks that about Edwards, but some people are surprised to hear him say that about Aquinas. Fact is, is it's true, there's, there's a handful of people in the history of the church that just have an intellect that is mind-boggling to us mere mortals. Uh, Augustine is that way, Aquinas is that way, Edwards is that way. And given Dr. Sproul's heavy emphasis on the, on the intellect, he, he just appreciated that. Those of you who've listened to or read him for years know he was constantly talking about we have to love the Lord our God not only with our heart but with our mind. And so anybody who used their mind to that extent, he respected. But there were, there were issues, of course, with Thomas, and so that still raises questions. Why, why this Roman Catholic? Why would he be so influential? Uh, the, the first thing, I think, to remember when we're talking about how and why somebody from the medieval church could be an influence, we have to remember the context of the Reformation itself. The Reformation, if you recall, was not an attempt to start from scratch in the 16th century, just tear down the whole building, tear out the foundation, and start over. They were addressing specific abuses, institutional abuses, theological abuses, moral and ethical abuses, but it wasn't an attempt to get rid of everything. We didn't reject, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity that was elaborated and formulated in the early and medieval church. We maintained and continued to teach that. Same thing with the, the doctrine of the divine attributes and the doctrine of the deity of Christ. We kept a lot of that. We didn't throw it out. Thomas represents that kind of thing. So there are elements in Thomas's theology that reform theology maintain. There's continuity there. There are other elements where they diverge quite radically. The main areas where you see Dr. Sproul and Reformed theology carrying on the tradition of an Aquinas 
it's usually things related to faith and reason, natural theology, or the doctrine of God. And those are the three main points I want to focus on today because those are the three points in Thomas's teaching that most influence Dr. Sproul. The relationship between faith and reason, which Thomas talks about in terms of the relationship between philosophy and theology, then natural theology, and then the doctrine of God. So we'll start by looking at uh, faith and reason. But before uh, I talk about that, I do want to mention that with someone like a, a Thomas, it's difficult for us in the 21st century to do what Dr. Sproul did, and that is critically appropriate him. There's a number of reasons for this. First of all, Thomas was writing in the 13th century, born 1224, 1225, died about 50 years later. So he's in the middle of the 13th century. It's a very different century than the 20th and 21st century. And he's assuming in his writings a lot of categories that we're just not familiar with. There are some words he uses, particularly in English translations of his works, we'll run across a word like substance, for example. And in our modern world, when we hear the word substance, we think of some kind of physical stuff, something, that, the substance of wood or the substance of iron, the, the substance that I can't scrape out of my bathtub or whatever it may be. It, that, that doesn't, it's not the same thing that that word means in Thomas. Another word that has caused quite a bit of consternation and confusion because of a misunderstanding of Thomas is the word relation. When we hear the word relation, we have a certain thing we conceive of in our mind. It carries certain connotations. When Thomas is using that word, it has a very specific technical meaning in terms of philosophical usage. Those are terms that he uses and that we think we understand. There are other terms he uses a lot that we're completely unfamiliar with in our day and age. One of the more important of these is the concept of potency and act. And we only have 30 minutes, so we don't have time to get into all the details of all of these concepts and terms. But something like potency and act is all over Thomas's writings. It's all over, and it's just included in the conceptual vocabulary of him, of the reformed scholastics that were writing in the generation immediately after Calvin and Luther, when when. Reformed theology was being brought into the universities and schools, scholasticism, scholastic, scholar, it's school theology. And so once Reformed theology became big enough that it could enter into the universities for the training of pastors, it developed its own uh, theology, a scholastic theology. And so act and potency was part of that vocabulary that is not part of ours. Thomas is also extremely systematic in his thinking. So more often than not, a full grasp of his thought on any one topic requires some understanding of his broader system of theology. But again, those are things that are beyond the scope of our time together. I want to focus on three areas where Aquinas most influenced Dr. Sproul. The first one I mentioned was faith and reason. In our world today, we're often told, and the idea is out there in the air, uh, that faith and reason are completely opposed. You find this in the writings of all kinds of people, uh, the new atheists that were very big 15 years ago. Sam Harris, for example, writes, it is time that we admitted that faith is nothing more than the license religious people give one another to keep believing when reasons fail. So faith is in opposition to reason, according to him. Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, they all said the same kind of thing. They pit faith against reason, faith against evidence, and all, the, all these things having to do with our rational faculties. Aquinas is helpful on this subject because he, in a very systematic and thorough way, points out something that Christians before him and Christians after him have tried to maintain, and that is that faith and reason not only aren't pitted against each other, but it correctly understood they can't be pitted against each other. Faith is only possible for creatures with a rational faculty, creatures that can use their reason. It's why our pews are not filled with dogs and cats and cows and everything else. They don't have the rational faculty to comprehend the things of faith that are being taught. Um, and, and that's a very basic level. We have to, it's only those with a rational faculty who can believe. 
Aquinas also addresses a separate question in his work, uh, de, de Veritate, that will examine ways we can respond to a proposition. I'll come back to that in a moment, but I want to illustrate why it is we can't, uh, we can't pit faith against reason here. Um, if I were to put up here a whiteboard or a, some kind of projector with a bunch of Mandarin Chinese characters on this and ask, do you believe that? There might be some of you in here who can read that and know whether you believe it. But for most of us, it's just going to be marks on a whiteboard. And you, If I asked you, do you believe that? You'd say, I don't know. What does it say? Or, or if I spoke to you, in a, in a different language. I know one of you in, in, in here will know what I'm saying, but if I read this, Ukestin uh, Hode, Egerthe Gar, and I ask you, do you believe that? Do you believe, if I say Egerthe Gar, do you believe that? Some of you are going to say, well, well, what does that mean? You know, it could, I could say, Er uh, ist auferstanden. Do you believe that? And some of you know what I said there, and you could answer yes or no. Or maybe this one might have a wider uh, recognition. No esta aquí, por qué ha resucitado? Do you believe that? Some of you can say amen. That's just Matthew 28, 6. It's the testimony of those angels who said, he is not here, he is risen. If I ask you that, is he risen? Or if I say he is risen, what's your response? Yes, he's risen indeed. You believe that. But how, how come? You couldn't respond that way to the languages you don't understand, Chinese or Greek or, or German or Spanish. If you don't understand those, you can't respond because your rational faculty isn't making the connection. You have to learn those languages in order to be able to respond and answer whether you believe or not. But faith requires at least the knowledge of what it is that you're being asked to believe. So that's very basic. But uh, Thomas goes farther than this. He explains that when, in, in his book that I mentioned, De Veritate, question 14, he explains that there are four ways we can respond to a proposition that's put in front of us. If I were to tell you that when I walked over here this morning, I got here really early, walked over from the RBC building, if I tell you on my way over here, I saw an alligator walking past the fountain in that quad area over there, you could say, Okay, I believe you, um, but you might be kidding. Uh, you, I can't tell. I don't know you well enough to know your sense of humor. You might be telling the truth, but you might be kidding. You, you could assent to that proposition. You could say, I believe that's true. There, there was an alligator. But you could also say, I assent to that and hold out the possibility that it's wrong. That's something Aquinas would have called an opinion, where you assent to the truth of the proposition, but you hold out the possibility that it could be wrong. On the other hand, you could say, I've, I've known Dr. Matheson for a while. He, he's a kidder. He's just joking. So I doubt seriously that he saw an alligator. But he might have. It might be true. That's something that uh, Aquinas would have called doubt. You deny the truth of the proposition, but you hold out the possibility that it might be true. Then there is what he would call knowledge. If I said that, you could say, yes, I believe that, that is true because I saw the alligator too over there this morning. That's, that's certain knowledge based on your own personal experience of that. The fourth one, you could say, I know Dr. Matheson well enough to know that he's generally honest. I don't have any reason to believe he's kidding at this moment. So I assent to the truth of that proposition without any qualifications because I believe he's telling the truth. You're accepting testimony, but you're doing so on the basis of reasons, reasons being what you know about me. So that's on the natural level. That happens all the time, every day. You know, I, I don't remember when I was born, but my parents tell me it was on this day and in this place, and I believe them. I don't have any reason to doubt it, and so that's faith. Everybody, many, many things, even the, even the new atheists and the old atheists, they all have faith in certain things. They believe a lot of things just as we believe a lot of things that we have no direct experience of. I never met George Washington. I believe he lived and was the first president, but I never saw him, never met him. I believe that on the basis of the testimony of writings. There are so many other things uh, that, are, that are based on this. Even the scientists, atheists like uh, Dawkins, who says faith is opposed to reason, most of the scientific knowledge he has, he has not done personal direct uh, 
laboratory ex experiments. He believes it based on the testimony of the textbooks he's read and the professors he's listened to. That's faith in that created level of faith. Now, obviously, when we get to faith in the gospel, faith in God, that requires regeneration. That's a, a different thing altogether. But the basic concept of faith, believing in something on the basis of testimony and believing the testimony on the basis of reasons you have to regard that testimony as truthful, is not in opposition. And that's, that was a key element in Dr. Sproul's teaching as well. He was very, very opposed to anti-intellectualism of any kind, inside and outside the church. So the truths of reason, he would always argue, are not opposed to the truths of faith because truth can't be opposed to truth. If God is one, uh, our triune God is, is one and has created all things that exist, everything that he has created, if he is a consistent being, and he is, cannot contradict itself and what he has revealed in general revelation about himself and what he's revealed in special revelation about himself can't contradict. And, and that was something that uh, Thomas was very influential in the thinking of Dr. Sproul. And that brings us to the second point and that's natural theology. After Thomas goes through this explanation of the relationship of faith and theology, I mean, philosophy and theology and faith and reason, he moves into this discussion of natural theology, and it follows what he's already said about faith and reason. And this becomes very clear in his arguments for the existence of God, and his influence on Dr. Sproul can be seen very clearly in Dr. Sproul's apologetics. He was kind of a lone voice for decades um, in, in the Reformed world in terms of his understanding of apologetics. And uh, he, he was more in line with Thomas Aquinas than he was with a lot of his Reformed brothers and sisters on this particular topic. But what is natural theology? Uh, this, again, could be an entire semester's talk, but at its heart, natural theology is dealing with the knowledge of God that we can have through using our reason and observing created effects, observing the revelation of God in his works. So we observe the works of God's hands and we learn, we can discern something using our reason about the nature of the one who did those works. Similar to this building, you can look at this building and know something about the craftsman who put it together. Not everything, but something about their skill and, and, their, and their power to put this, this building together. So he deals, Thomas that is, deals with natural theology extensively in both the Summa Theologiae and the Summa Contra Gentiles. Summa Contra Gentiles is an, a, primarily an apologetic work and the first three, there's four books and the first three are almost entirely natural theology. And then in the fourth book, he turns to deal with special revelation. The Summa Theologiae is more of an instruction manual for young theologians. And so it, it's all blended together, but he starts off by talking about uh, natural theology and these five arguments, the five ways uh, that he talks about regarding the existence of God. In the, in the other Summa, it's much longer discussion and even longer discussions in some of his other works. But in the Summa Theologiae, it's the five ways is a very brief section of one chapter. And he, he lays out all of these arguments and every one of them is a little bit uh, complicated given that we don't have the conceptual vocabulary of the 13th century, but at at the risk of gross oversimplification, what all of them are doing is looking at created effects in the world and arguing from effect back to cause. The first of his five ways is probably the most well-known, and that is the so-called argument for motion. And here's another one of those words that can become a problem for us because that, that word motion, when we hear it, we think of movement from one place to another or movement of something that's spinning. In, in the older, in, in, in the Latin that uh, Thomas was using, it, it had a broader connotation. Basically, he's talking about change of any kind, not just change from one place to another, but any kind of change. And he's arguing that all, everything in creation changes and again, bring it, that idea of potency and act that I mentioned before, if you, if you get a grasp of what, he, what those things mean, using that, he argues that if we observe anything in creation that's changing, there has to be an unchanging creator as a first cause. 
Obviously, that argument's much more detailed and, and complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. And if you've ever heard Dr. Sproul's lecture on the ice cream cone argument for the existence of God, that's basically a development of what Thomas is getting at, this idea that you can look at anything in creation, even an ice cream cone, a blade of grass, a mosquito, you name it, anything in creation that is contingent and changing, if you think carefully through it, it will point to the existence of an eternal, unchangeable first cause. And Thomas ends every one of those arguments, and this we call God. It's, it's this just what we can learn from general revelation. That leads into the broader doctrine of God, because one thing that Thomas makes very clear is there's only certain things that we can know about God from general revelation. And he appeals to Romans 1 on this, and Reformed theologians have followed him in this. Dr. Sproul also that we can know that God exists by looking at the created works. We can know certain of his attributes by looking at his created works. But I can't go outside and look up at the stars in the middle of the night and say, ah, that teaches the Trinity. There are certain things about God that can only be known by us if he directly reveals them. So special revelation, scripture, uh, divine verbal revelation is necessary if we're going to know these things. We can't know the gospel by looking at the stars. We can't know the incarnation by looking at grass or an ice cream cone. All of that requires special revelation. And so Aquinas starts to move at this point from faith and reason, natural theology, what we can know about God just on the basis of creation, that he exists and some of his attributes. And then he begins developing and talking about these divine attributes. Uh, he, he moves from a discussion of existence to divine simplicity, perfection, goodness, infinity, immutability, eternity, unity, knowledge, life, will, love, justice, all the divine attributes. And Dr. Sproul and Reformed theologians, or early Reformed theologians, tended to follow this order of discussion. And what it shows is what he's trying to get at is there's an overlap. You have certain things that philosophy looks at the physical world, and philosophy was used in a much broader sense back then, so the natural sciences would have been included. You can look at anything in the natural world, and using your reason and your mind, discover things. You can look at the human body over time and discover how the circulatory system works, or the respiratory system, or whatever. You can learn, look at animals and learn uh, about how they do things, and look at the skies and discern the movement of the stars and, or the movement of the earth, depending on what period of church history you're talking about. But you can learn these things by observation. And then at the height of what philosophy can do is knowing just some basic things about God, that God exists and some attributes. But those things about God are also revealed in special revelation. So you have a, a handful of things that overlap here general revelation and special revelation overlap because the Bible also teaches the existence of God and all of those attributes. But it also teaches a lot of things that we can't know by the observing creation and just using our mind. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity. So this brings us to the third, uh, well, the, the doctrine of God uh, was the third thing. And I want to mention a little bit about the title of this seminar, God as Pure Being. This is one of the things that Thomas spends a lot of time on. For him, the word being means that which is or that which exists in the sense of that which has the act of existence, meaning the word being can be understood in two different ways. You can think of being as a noun, a being, or you can think of being as a verb, b-ing, something that is in the act of to be-ness. You know, I am a, a being, but I also am in the act of existing right now. I'm being. I'm a being who is being. And that's one of the, the key things he talks about. And that leads to this idea of God as pure actuality, which is one of the key attributes of God. Dr. Sproul used to always say that every time he thought about the pure actuality of God, it would give him chills. For most of us, when we first start to study theology, if you hear him say that, you what in the world are you talking about? What in the world is a pure actuality? It's so foreign to our way of thinking. And again, it would take a long time to get into all the details about it, but when we say that God is pure actuality, basically all we're saying is he's the one being who is, is perfect. He is 
he, nothing is incomplete in him. Everything is perfectly realized in him. He is absolutely perfect, or to use the language of the Westminster Confession, he is most absolute. Uh, he names himself in scripture, I am. I amness, beingness is part of his very nature. It, it is his nature to exist, which is why theologians talk about the fact that his existence in essence can't be separated. He's not a compound being compounded of essence and existence. Existing is who and what he is. Unlike all created beings whose existence depends at every moment upon God, God's existence, he is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anyone or anything for his perfect and immutable and eternal being. And when you begin to get a glimpse of God in this way, you can understand a little bit better why Dr. Sproul said it gave him chills to think about this, because we're talking about the creator-creature distinction. And that leads me to the last thing I want to discuss in our remaining few minutes, and that is kind of the, the, the awkward way this language often hits us, this language of classical theism. When I say pure actuality and divine simplicity and immutability, all these attributes about God, a lot of people just kind of instinctively react. It gives them the creepy crawlies. You know, they think that's just weird because we know when we read scripture, we're reading about our Father in heaven, the Father who created us, who redeemed us, who loved us, who covenants with us, who who Zephaniah 317, who sings over us, who rejoices over us. And when we start hearing this language of pure actuality and immutability and divine simplicity, that's so cold and abstract and clinical. I've used an illustration with my classes before. I've told them to try to help them understand this. If, if any of you out here asked me to tell you about my wife and I stood up here and said, oh, she's amazing. She's a carbon-based life form. She is mutable, finite, a, a contingent being. Every single one of you would, you'd be thinking, what in the world is the matter with that man? And why did his wife marry him? Because that's not the kind of thing you write down on a Valentine's Day card or say when you're proposing. It, it doesn't make any sense. And part of the reason why that's the case is when in our context, if you ask me to tell you about my wife, we're talking about a context of human beings. It's all human beings. So it's not necessary to say those things. That's just a given that she's a, you know, a, a contingent finite being. I'm going to tell you about her loving care of our children and her smile and those kind of things. The reason it's necessary to get into this sometimes cold and abstract sounding language about God, this language of classical theism, is because we have the tendency not to remember that God is not in this level of being. He is creator, we are creatures. Christians and pagans, pagans as always, Christians sometimes fall into this, of either bringing God down to our level or just completely annihilating the creator-creature distinction and thinking of him as just a big version of us. You look at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and you have this picture of God as an old man about to touch the finger of Adam. And we can often, in our thinking about God, start to think of God as a big old man who is quantitatively different from us. He's much more powerful and bigger and smarter, but still quantitatively different. He's just a longer living version of us. That's why this language ends up becoming necessary to make sure we always remember that the God that created us, that loved us, that covenants with us is that kind of being, not this kind of being. He's not a human being. He's the creator. We constantly forget that, but that's where this language comes into play and why it, why it becomes necessary. And that, again, is why when we think of this, if we comprehend it, it should give us chills to, to know that God is eternal and infinite and immutable, that he, he doesn't depend on anything or anyone else for his existence. That's mind-boggling, and it should drive us to our knees in awe and adoration of our Heavenly Father who has, who has done this. Um, we should be able to say, as Moses did after God uh, brought Israel through the Red Sea, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And he's talking about fake, false gods, Egyptian gods and Babylonian gods, not that they really exist other than the fact that they're demonic. But who is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, 
doing wonders. Or with the psalmist, blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. All of this language is something that um, should, should just constantly, theology should just constantly be overflow in our hearts into this kind of doxology and praise. But don't let the weird language get you down. You, many of you knew Dr. Sproul or listened to him for many years. You know how passionate he was about God and how much he wanted to love the Lord as God with all of his heart and soul and mind and strength. And this doesn't do away with that unless you're not careful with it. If you're not careful with it, yes, it can become a diversionary thing and you can start to look at God. The opposite error can be made. God's no longer a human being like us, but he's some Aristotelian rock out there in space. It's neither of those, but we have to keep the creator-creature distinction in mind. And if we do that, we can avoid both of these of these errors. And that's where Thomas was helpful to Dr. Sproul, and that's where he can be helpful with us. Once Thomas gets out of the realm of talking about the creator and moves into his discussion of creation, and he gets into nature-grace dichotomies and gets into his definition of sin and redemption, that's where things diverge. And that's where the reformers and Dr. Sproul, myself, would be very critical of Thomas. But on these doctrines where we overlap, we can learn a lot from him, as the reform scholastics did when they basically cut and paste, pasted his doctrine of God and doctrine of the Trinity and built on that. I think we're about out of time, so thank you for your patience. Let's pray, and then we'll, I believe we'll have lunch at this point. So our Father in God, we come before you, your needy children, standing before you in awe and in adoration. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us, and we thank you that you first loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and that because of what you have done, we now have an eternal inheritance that we did not deserve. We thank you, O Lord, and we ask that for the rest of this day you would give us wisdom, that you would open our hearts to the truth, that you would, uh, just by your grace, enable us to love you more and more, conform us more and more to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the food we're about to receive, ask that you would bless it, nourish our bodies and our minds in order that we may serve you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.